Good morning, everybody. It is great to be with you today. I hope that you are all doing well. I want to make sure to take a moment to thank everybody who helped with VBS. You, you all did a great job, and I am so proud of how you all came together uh, to create such a fantastic opportunity for our young people to learn more about God and what it means to, to be deeper in relationship with Him. So if you were part of that, thank you very much. Throughout the year of 2024, uh, we have been emphasizing the idea of fellowship, uh, that fellowship is joining in God's redemptive plan, which of course includes uh, growing our relationship and connection together, but it goes beyond that, that we grow our relationship and connection with one another uh, so that we might help each other follow Christ more faithfully and ultimately so we might take the gospel to the entire world. It, it's joining in God's redemptive plan. And one of the ways that we are attempting to emphasize fellowship is by reading texts that talk in terms of aspects of fellowship. And this month we've got James chapter 2, verses 14 through 17. Now let's read this text together. What good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can that faith save him? If a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, be warmed and filled, Without giving them the things needed for the body, what good is that? So also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. You got your Bibles, go ahead and turn with me to Matthew chapter 11. But before you do that, how many Bibles do we have? What a fantastic sight. Matthew chapter 11. I want us to read verses 25 through 26. Uh, Jesus has just been rejected by these unrepentant cities. And he turns to the Father uh, and expresses thanks. Beginning in verse 25. At that time, Jesus declared, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and understanding and revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, for such was your gracious will. Elsewhere, Jesus will say that if you want to enter the kingdom of heaven, you must first be humble like a little child. Uh, he'll express that if you want to be the greatest in the kingdom of heaven, you must be like a child. And to not let the little, not hinder the little children, but rather let the little children come to them, for such is the kingdom of God. It would seem that perhaps... Perhaps we have something to learn from children. Over the last several weeks, uh, as we begin to prepare for baby number three, Lord help us. But as we begin to prepare for baby number three, I found myself reminiscing and thinking about what it's meant to be a father and some of the lessons that I've learned. I found myself contemplating, why did God grant us children? Uh, why does God give humanity children? Uh, and I can't help but wonder if perhaps there's three reasons. Uh, the first being, well, to, to populate the earth so that there is a future generation so that civilization can continue and humanity can to continue. I wonder if a second reason might be just simply to enrich our lives. And, and by our lives, I don't simply mean the lives of parents, but of our lives as the family of God and our lives as society. For one of the great blessings about being a young preacher with kids is watching those who are a little further in years, their eyes light up with joy as they watch little Lucas run around like a crazy person or as they interact with other children around them. But, but watching their eyes light up as they see once again through the eyes of a little child and look at the world with the wonder and excitement that only young eyes can. And so I wonder if a second reason is just simply to enrich our lives so that we might have the joy that children bring. But I wonder if a third reason might be to teach us something about him. Because it seems that Jesus conveys that, that we have something to learn from children. Certainly their humility and their willingness to, to listen, but perhaps maybe we have more to learn as well. And so today, I simply want to explore five lessons that my children have taught me. Five lessons that my children have taught me, and perhaps we can learn a little bit together. Oh, this is what we just read. 
the first lesson is children need guidance. Remember as a child going to the fridge one morning, I opened the fridge and pulled out uh, this large thing of vanilla pudding. I mean, that sucker was that big. It was great. And it was nice and cold, and I was so looking forward to that first taste of vanilla pudding. For there's nothing like the first taste of cold vanilla pudding hitting your tongue. And I found the biggest spoon that I could possibly find, grabbed a giant chunk of that, stuck it in my mouth, and spit it out just as fast as I could. For unbeknownst to me, there were two containers in that fridge. One was vanilla pudding, and the other congealed chicken broth. And they do not taste the same. Now, some of you may be wondering, why were you eating pudding for breakfast? Well, that's a good question. The short answer is, I love sweets. Uh, but as a kid, one of my favorite times was when my mom would let it be known that the next morning we were going to have to fend for ourselves, that, that she was going to sleep in, she wasn't making breakfast that morning, and that we were going to have to find breakfast ourselves. And I was so excited because, like I said, I love sweets. And so I would quickly begin making pudding from scratch uh, so that I could put it in the fridge and it would be perfectly ready the next morning, and thus the, my debacle. It turns out that my kids must have not fallen far from the tree. For they love sweets as well. And any opportunity they get, they will choose sugar over healthy food every single opportunity. I mean, I can't really blame them, but that's what they will do. Children without guidance seem to make poor decisions. Now, not always. They occasionally make good decisions, but they often make poor decisions. And why shouldn't they? I mean, they're, they're new to this world, learning how to live in it. But children will run right out into the street, regardless and heedless of the cars going every which way. Uh, children, when given the opportunity to do something healthy or do something fun, they'll choose fun every single time. Uh, children struggle at times to dress appropriately, and I don't mean uh, modestly, I mean appropriate for the weather, for it seems that shorts are perfect for snow, and it seems that thermals are perfect for when it's 120 degrees. Children without guidance often make poor decisions. And yet, despite their poor decisions, they seem pretty confident it's the right decision. I'm convinced that the best lawyers in the world are toddlers. For nobody will argue a case more forcefully and more passionately and more convincingly than a toddler who is dead wrong. And yet, somehow, why should we expect children to be any different, though? For they, for they are just learning how to exist within this world, and they haven't learned what it means to survive, and they need someone to guide them so they can survive within this society. I'm reminded of Proverbs chapter 3. Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he will make straight your paths. Be not wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and turn away from evil. It will be healing to your flesh and refreshment to your bones. And do not lean on your own understanding. Do not be wise in your own eyes. It would seem that we too as humans need direction. There's another proverb that says, There is a way that seems right to a man, but in the end it leads to death. That we, too, have a tendency to make poor decisions for as we grow and as we mature, we learn a little bit. We learn more of how to live in this world, but the truth is that we learn just enough to be dangerous. Just enough to think that we know what we're doing. But the reality is that we do not know how to live as we ought. Which is why when Christ came, he came and said, that I have come that they may have life and have it abundantly there. In John 10.10, 10, and the present tense of that phrase means both life now and continuing. That Christ has come that we might have life complete now and on into eternity. That we too need direction. That we shouldn't rely upon our own understanding, but that if we desire to find true life, to truly be able to live in this world, and if we desire to be able to live on into eternity that we are to rely not on our own understanding, but rather to follow the direction of God. So the first lesson is that children need guidance just as we need guidance. Lesson number two, children need to be cleaned. 
I'm a 90s kid, which means I grew up watching Steve Irwin, The Crocodile Hunter. <laughs> yes, I too liked him. I don't know who said that, but that, there was something infectious about his energy. And he would sneak up on the most ridiculous animals and try and poke them with sticks. Here it is, a king cobra, uh, one bite of venom, venom and he's going to die, and he's going to try and sneak over there and get as close as he can and touch it. There was something infectious about his energy. And one of my favorite, uh, one of the, my favorite parts of almost every episode was when he would sneak up on crocodiles. He had to sneak up in the, just the right way, he had to sneak up behind him, and usually it took like three or four guys to get on this giant alligator, one of them holding his jaws and wrestling every which way, and the other's beginning to pile on trying to hold down this mammoth struggling alligator. And as a kid, I remember thinking, what must that be like? And then I had kids. And I tried to change their diapers, and I found out what it was like. For if you've ever tried to wrestle a little kid in their diaper, I don't know how they packed that much strength and energy in that tiny little body. But they're uncomfortable because they want to be clean. And yet they're wrestling with everything they have because they don't want to be clean. And I found myself wondering, How many times have I been in the same situation with my God? Where I find myself uncomfortable because I'm living a kind of filthy life. And I need to be cleaned and yet I'm resisting just as much as I can. And I wonder if at times he doesn't from on high say, would you just sit still for a minute? I'm trying to help you. I'm reminded of James chapter 1. Count it all joy, my when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. It seems that God cleans us through trial, through the, through the refining fire that he talks about. And the reality is that it can be a little bit uncomfortable for nobody likes trials, nobody likes suffering. It's never an enjoyable thing, and I suspect that, clean, that as I'm cleaning my son, I'm, I suspect it's a little uncomfortable too, and yet he always seems more comfortable after the fact. And yet how many times do we find ourselves asking, why is God doing this to me? Why has this happened to me? And I can't help but wonder if he's there on high saying, I'm just trying to help you. I know it's uncomfortable for a, month, for a minute, but I'm just trying to clean you. You'll be so much better afterwards. The children need to be clean. Turns out we need to be clean too. Lesson number three. Children are inquisitive. That wonderful three-letter word, why. Daddy, why is the sky blue? Well, you know, it's because of the way the light particles and the water interact, uh, and as a result, the sky is blue. Well, why? Because that's the way physics works. Well, why? Because God created it that way. Well, why? That's a good question. I don't know. Why? Children are inquisitive, and they ask why over and over and over and over and over again to the point where it almost starts to get a little bit annoying, but it's how they learn about the world how they interact with the world, uh, how they come to understand how the world works. And I wonder if at times as, children, as adults, we cease asking why. Maybe because we were told to be quiet too many times. Uh, maybe because we think we finally arrived at all the answers, or maybe we're just out of time and tired and worn out and just don't care anymore. I don't know. But we need to be inquisitive and ask why, especially of God. There's nothing wrong with asking God, why? Why did you do this? Why is this happening? Why is this taking place? The question is where we go with that why question. For when we ask God the question, why have you done this? We have the opportunity to wrestle with him. I'm reminded of the book of Job. And as you read through Job, Job essentially asks the question, why has this happened and why are you doing with this, doing this way? I, I don't understand. This doesn't make sense to me. 
And he asks some fairly bold things of God. And at the end of the book, Job is considered to be righteous, despite despite the rather pointed questions that he asks, and even some of the accusations that he levies. So why then is he considered righteous? Because he went to God with the questions that he had. When we ask why questions, we have the opportunity to wrestle with God. And as you wrestle with somebody, you get to know somebody very well. Have you ever noticed that Zoom wrestling doesn't work? It doesn't work because you can't get close to the other person. But to wrestle, you have to be near someone. You have to be right up in their space. And as a result, you kind of get to know them a little bit better. And the same is true of God. That as we ask why questions, we have the opportunity to wrestle with him. And as we wrestle, we have the opportunity to better know him and better understand him and perhaps learn something about him. For example, in Genesis chapter 20, we encounter the story of Abraham and Abimelech. Now, you may be familiar with the story. It's the second time that Abraham lies about Sarah being his sister as opposed to his wife. And as a result, Abimelech takes Sarah, because apparently she was a real hottie, uh, takes Sarah and brings, him to her, brings her to his harem. And he doesn't sleep with her or anything, and man, God prevents uh, evil from taking place in that moment. But Abimelech is struck with illness. And Abimelech says, well, I haven't done anything wrong because God comes to Abimelech and says, the woman you have is Abraham's wife. And Abimelech says, I haven't done anything wrong. God says, you're right. In the story, Abraham does everything wrong. Abimelech does everything right. But God sides with Abraham and not Abimelech. Why? We're not explicitly told. But Abraham is called the friend of God. I can't help but wonder if if perhaps it's because of all the times that Abraham was loyal to God, all the times that he was a friend to God, and so God remained loyal to him even when Abraham did not behave as he should. That perhaps from the story, by asking why does this take place, perhaps we learn something about God's loyalty, that he doesn't just abandon us because we fail, but that he stays loyal to us, especially when we're trying to seek him, even when in those moments we're weak. But to arrive at those conclusions, we have to ask the question, why? Just as children are as inquisitive, so we too should be inquisitive as well. And without faith, it is impossible to please him. For whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. That as we draw near to God, we learn more about who he is and come to wrestle with him so that we might learn about him. Number four, children trust completely. One of the most precious feelings that exists throughout all of creation are those moments when a little child falls asleep in your arms, whether it's your child or not, especially if it's yours, but whether it's yours or not, holding that little child and looking into their eyes and seeing complete trust and having them fall asleep on you is one of the best feelings that exists. That children trust completely. And they rely upon those who take care of them completely. And if we are to be able to follow our God, we too have to follow our God completely and trust him completely. And just as children trust, so we too are to trust our God. But perhaps the greatest lesson, perhaps the greatest lesson that I have learned from my children is the deep you got your Bibles, Romans chapter 5. Beginning in verse 6. For while we were still weak, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare even to die. But God shows his love for us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since therefore we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. For if while we were enemies we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, 
Much more, now that we are reconciled, should we be saved by his life. More than that, also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. I remember the first time that I held my son. I remember seeing him. You guys have heard me describe Manny before when he was a little bitty, that he looked a little bit like a frog. Uh, because he had really big feet, really skinny legs, and he was only about three pounds, five ounces. So he was a little bitty thing, but he was super long. And I remember holding him there in my arms, just sure that he was going to break, because he was born five weeks early. And I was just sure that he was going to break this little bitty bundle. And I remember thinking to myself, don't you touch my baby. I remember looking at all the nurses, giving them all the evil eye of, don't you touch my baby. Even though they were trying to help, and I knew they were, but, but there was a part of me that was very concerned that should I hand off my baby, that something was going to happen. And in that moment, my understanding of who God is and his love for mankind changed forever. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. was up to me, the whole world would have burned. Because there ain't no way I would have given up my baby. And it brings into focus when Jesus there on the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? For if my son had reached out, Daddy, where are you? The whole world would have burned. And yet our God, because of his great love for us, it emphasizes the great love that he has that he was willing to send his son because it is evidence of his love. And perhaps the greatest lesson that our children teach us is the immense love that God must have for us. I want us to sing a song together. How deep the Father's love. And as we sing it, I want us to contemplate the love that God must have had and still has for us that he would be willing to send his son. How deep the Father's love for us, how vast beyond all measure that he should give his only Son to make a wretch his treasure. How great the pain of searing loss. The Father turns his face away as wounds which mar the chosen. sons to glory. Behold the man upon a cross, my sin upon his shoulder. Ashamed I hear my mocking scoffers it was my sin that dealt him there until it was accomplished his dying breath has brought me life I know that it is finished. I will not boast in anything. No gifts, no power, no wisdom. But I will boast in Jesus Christ, his death and resurrection. Why should I gain from his reward? I cannot give an answer, but this I know with all my heart. His wounds have paid my ransom.
greatest lesson we learn from our children is the great unfathomable depths of our God who would send his only son for us. Perhaps you're here today and you want to begin a relationship with the one who loves you most, the one who sacrificed everything for you. And there's nothing that would excite us more than to help you begin that journey which starts at baptism. Or perhaps you're here today and you need the prayers of the church. If there's any way we can assist you, won't you come as together we stand and sing.